Hello and welcome you all. I'm live here with my good friend and teaching partner, Clayton Olson. And we are concurrently live on both of our channels. And this is an experiment. We're excited for you to be here with us. Clayton, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Yeah, yeah you look I'm well. Like, you look Thank well. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think part, it's partly because of the lighting. And uh, another part is one. I've got a bit of a short week. I'm, I'm taking off uh, camping. Uh, this weekend, heading out to Utah, so I'm really oh, excited amazing. about that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So how about you, man? How are you doing? I've had a great day so far. Yeah, um, just had a, a, a group call and some individual coaching, and uh, it's a sunny day here. And I'm excited to be in conversation with you. I always enjoy being in dialogue with you. Um, so we've entitled this live stream, you know, being frustrated in relationship. Try this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any particular common patterns of frustration that you notice, uh, hmm. particularly women having in, in relationship? Yeah, yeah. I would say the one that comes to mind even before you finish asking that question was uh, this pattern of dating uh, either emotionally unavailable partners, yeah. Um, yeah. folks that aren't actually ready for a relationship and being in, caught in this cycle of feeling really frustrated that, uh, things aren't lining up and they don't want the same thing that you want, uh, mm -hmm. or um, maybe being in a, a, a partnership that is like semi-committed, uh, but there's some level of toxicity that continues to yes. play out over and over again. And oftentimes, if you really take a step back and feel into it, it can be really difficult to do it in the moment. But when you get a little bit of hindsight, you look back at your previous relationships that you've had with partners or um, connections, you realize there's like a common theme of frustration. There's a common theme of toxicity that might date all the way back to when you were a little kid with your, uh, the relationship that you had with your parents. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So if you are joining us, welcome. We are live here and feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're from. Um, we will be getting to a few questions later. And we're particularly interested in questions that relate to the themes that Clayton and I are talking about. Um, so Clayton, you and I have kind of developed a, a philosophy, if you will. It's also a mm. program in a community, but before anything, it's a philosophy um, called Becoming the One. Yeah. And I'm curious for folks that haven't come across that philosophy, what do you see as the kind of the essence or the distinguishing factors of Becoming the One? Yeah. So... I think there's a number of different ways to say what we're pointing to with this philosophy of becoming mm -hmm. the one. But, you know, oftentimes I think that people are so, uh, there's a fixation on finding the one um, or, you know, are they the one for me or who is my person out there? Right. You know, when, when will I find them? And it, oftentimes there's this neglect that happens of uh, really using the crucible of dating and relationship and um, also to the platform of being single to really find out who you are and really connect mm. in deeply and see who you are at your core and then how to live an aligned life from there, how to live an aligned dating experience from there. So, mm. you know, I see this, this concept of becoming the one, it means uh, how do you become the one for you first so that you're not needing a partner uh, from a place of feeling incomplete, um, but rather you're wanting and desiring a partner because of the possibility of what the two of you could create together. And it, I, I think that is such a simple way of saying it, but the, the shift itself, the embodiment of that shift has profound impact on the things that you put up with in relationship, uh, the type of men that you're attracted to, and your ability to be able to set boundaries and actually fight for the relationship rather than be in a place of reactivity. And, you know, we've, we've coined this term before too, relationship by accident rather than relationship totally. by purpose. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds, like it, well, yeah. it sounds like you're talking about coming from a place of wholeness or mm. completeness rather than, you know, the classic sort of Jerry Maguire line, like you complete me. It's yeah. like, hey, maybe I actually complete myself. And from that place, mm what I'm available for in relationship might look different. Mm -hmm. If I've been attracting patterns of frustration or unavailability, maybe that looks different because I'm, I'm not sort of grasping quite so much externally. And yeah. I'm more centered in myself. I'm more present. I'm more aware. I'm more mm -hmm. content in a way. 
Like it almost sounds like acknowledging that singleness is a gift as well as relationship is a gift, mm. um, rather than relationship is this constant missing piece and frustration. So I yeah. sort of go kind of begging for it and I, I go kind of grasping for it. And in that, I'm not really bringing my truer, deeper essence, as we would call it, into the connection. Totally, yeah. totally, yes, yes. Yeah, it's almost like being single. Uh, many of us have this uh, relationship to being single as this fallen state, right? Mm. Like. Like if I'm single, like there's a period that I can be single for, but like if I'm still single at a certain age or I've had a number of failed relationships, that means that there's something wrong with me or mm. that I'm, that, yeah, there's something fundamentally wrong or incorrect about who I'm being and uh, out there in the world. And I hear what you're saying is, you know, becoming the one is about bringing your essence to the table. And I mean, that really takes some courage. It that does. takes an incredible amount of courage because when you bring your real self to the table, it's like there's something really at risk there. There but is. How are you gonna find the person uh, that you wanna spend a long period of time with, maybe the rest of your life with, if you don't put something at risk and you don't allow them to actually see who you really are? Right. Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a calibrated risk, right? I think there's probably no reward without some kind of risk, right? Every time you kind of get in your car, you take a risk. Every time you leave your house, you kind of take a risk. Yeah. But you're saying that actually there's a bigger risk, which is if you never bring your real self to relationship, you're yeah. never going to have uh, probably the longevity of relationship, but it's, it's almost like you never get to exist in relationship. Yeah. Because if the real you isn't there, then who is showing up? It's this kind of performance or this persona, mm. this, this kind of smaller version of you, right? Mm. I think you're talking about bringing this kind of bigger version of you in, into the connection. Yes, yes. And to, to that point too, there's another little piece here that's really fascinating that's coming up as you're, I hear you talking too, is that uh, if you're not bringing yourself in the relationship, then suddenly relationship uh, feels like you have to make some type of decision between either being yourself or being wow. in a relationship. Wow, yeah. Right, and so, and I see this with... Uh, clients that I've worked with, I see this with people that uh, maybe are, they're, they're frustrated with feeling like they have to dim themselves down or that they're consistently other referencing, focusing on what the other person's needs are so much that they find relationship as an exhausting experience. And maybe they're just better off being single, but then being mm. single, they feel lonely and they know they want a relationship deep at heart, but it's like they have to sacrifice something rather than being completely aligned and being yeah. able to be themselves and be loved for it. Yes. Yes, totally. Well said. So I just want to say a few quick hellos because we've got, got, got a lot of people who've joined us here. Yeah. Um, so welcome to Claire, Tuwin, Sue, Sarah, Narita, Joe, a couple of other Sarahs, Chicago, Miami, um, Rebecca, um, Callie. Uh, she says, thanks for doing this live video. Love you guys. Uh, we've got Sue in England, Chelsea, Oladeo, uh, Yukalena, Estralita, Jane, Sarah. W welcome to all you guys. And thanks so much for being here. Um, we are live. We are talking about frustration patterns in relationship. And we're talking about becoming the one. And if you're interested to know more about this, um, Clayton, do you want to just share a little bit about the opportunity that we've got going right now? And yep. um, I'll pop this up on the screen for people that are interested. So if any of you have been following us for a while, uh, Jack and I, one of our uh, flagship programs that we've created that was in utero for a couple of years uh, is a program called- Because you were playing hard to get, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was building the anticipation. Uh, we, we created a program called Relationship Ready, Becoming the One. And it, uh, it uh, exists in a couple different forms. And uh, it's essentially a six module course that is, designed to completely transform the relationship that you have with yourself in the domain of your love life. And it it's, doesn't matter whether you're single or whether you're in a relationship, uh, the philosophy in the exercises and uh, the places that we take you in this program are designed to give you a completely new operating system and help you understand men from a different perspective, help you understand yourself from a different perspective, uh, give you agency and the ability to express yourself cleanly and communicate confidently in the relationship, uh, to access levels of vulnerability in your heart, uh, and also learning how to uh, surrender and let go simultaneously so that you can actually feel safe. 
you can actually feel safe, trust life, and trust that exact where you are is exactly where you need to be and come from that place in dating. And, you know, we, I, I'm going to say, I'll speak for myself here and I would love to hear uh, maybe the reason why you wanted to get involved in this, but for, for myself, I, I see that relationship is one of the places where from the life coaching that I've done over the last eight years, it is one of the places where people experience the most pain and suffering, the most frustration, for sure. some of the deepest insecurities. And if you don't have your relationship and love life, uh, to some extent handled, it affects everything. It affects your work. It affects your friendships. It affects your relationship with your family. And it can throw everything off kilter. So I'm a firm believer that if you can get some movement and some momentum in this arena and uh, really start to get this part of your life handled, that it, it changes your life forever permanently. Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, I would say for me when I, you know I've been in, in in Colorado for about eight years now, same. So uh, yeah. not the same as you, but the same as you were saying you were coaching. Yeah, and I remember when I first come here, I'd sometimes hear people talk about relationship as path, and you know I love hiking, but it didn't really make that much sense to me. And I'd say over the last you know five to seven years, it's it's made a lot of sense to me that if you are interested in growing, right? And I think pretty much everyone, you know, give us a one in the comments if you're interested in growing. I think pretty much everyone here right now is interested in growing, right? Whether you actually want a relationship or not, whether you're in a relationship or not. So if that's true, you know, relationships can be personal growth machines, right? To use that expression, that relationship will show you things that you, maybe your work will never show you, right? Maybe you have some difficulties with making money or maybe you have difficulties with choosing a career or your coworkers, mm -hmm. but relationship will normally show you your unfi unfinished business of childhood, yeah. right? If you and I wanna be free, if we want to be loving, if we want to be in our hearts and expressed, the business of the unfinished business of childhood is the place where that shows up, right? Whatever you learn to do as a little one to survive your childhood is probably still going on at an unconscious level, right? Whether it's being a pleaser, mm -hmm. a performer, whether it's minimizing your needs, whether it's overly emotionalizing your needs, whether it's weak boundaries, strong boundaries. You know, some people make a decision in childhood, yeah, I'm never going to be vulnerable again because I don't want anyone else treating me like that, mm -hmm. right? And I'll, I'll listen to interviews with entrepreneurs, successful people in culture who are in their 50s mm -hmm. and are still in reaction to the bully in the, in the playground or the person who humiliated them. And they said, you know what, that's never going to happen to me again. But that's a difficult thing when it comes to being in relationship because if you're never vulnerable, you never open your heart you're never capable of the of, of loving in the way that you want to be loved and receiving love in the way that you want to be loved. Mm. So that's probably what I'm excited about becoming the one is, is the ability to, to finish some of that business of childhood and to stop reliving those unconscious patterns, right? Probably of the six modules, my favorite one is waking up module two, because mm. that's where we just drill down deep on what was the thing that you set up in childhood that you needed to survive your childhood, completely yeah. acceptable, it's totally understandable, and it's now holding you back and probably has been most of your adult life. Let's look there because yeah. that's the path of your liberation. That's the path of your ennoblement. That's the path of relationship. And I think that's why relationship is the path of consciousness for most people, you know, in our cultures at this time. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well said. Yeah. And um, I want to say that if you, have been experiencing frustration in relationship, uh, it 99 percent of the time it leads back to exactly what Jack's talking about. And that when you begin to clean this stuff up, when you start to remove the kind of unconscious shrapnel that may mm -hmm. have occurred uh, from some of the trauma or some of the experiences you had as a kid, it frees you up to not only see your value in relationship, but to feel that you can express yourself fully in relationship uh, without fear of the person leaving you, uh, without a concern that you're either too much for them uh, or that you're too little for them. Mm. In some ways, I'd say that what this program does truly is it begins to move you into a place of secure attachment, which I believe is the holy grail of relationship. When we can right. operate from a place of yep. trusting ourselves, trusting other and trusting life, um, everything shifts. Yeah, that's powerful. And, you know, by the way, if you're 
you know, wanting to learn more about attachment, real compatibility, which is module four of the program is where we, we dive into that fully. Um, and it was interesting creating that with you, Clayton, because you and I also have slightly divergent sort of dominant attachment experiences, right? Where maybe yeah. I've been a little bit more prone on the anxious side, you maybe been a bit more prone on the avoidance side. So I think that gave us a real ability to kind of dimensionalize the program. Mm -hmm. And also I, I happen to think, I'll just talk for myself, like I've learned a lot from being in relationship, in working relationship and friendship with you, mm -hmm. because I see the gifts of something that historically maybe I didn't really connect with the gifts of, and um, that's actually allowed me to be less afraid of, you know, a, a different strategy than mine or any kind of avoidance. Cause mm. it's like, actually that's not all bad. That's yeah. a really highly adaptive survival strategy that has a lot of good and it, and it carries some liabilities just like any of these attachment styles does. So if you want to know more about attachment, I just, I really want to encourage you to come and join us for this trial. It's literally $1. You get to try out this program, which, you know, everyone who's in it prior to this has invested at least $500 or more, up to $1,000 to be in. And yep. for $1, you can just join us for 14 days. You get access to the first module, um, which I'll ask you a bit about, Clayton, called the vision mm -hmm. of a conscious relationship. You also get access to module two, waking up. You get our ebook that we co wrote called The Four Pillars of Conscious Relationship. Um, and I think, is there something else that people get as well? Is there a second um, bonus? Or does that come? At the end of the trial, I think that comes right at the end of the trial. We're going okay. yeah, to explain a program called Actions of Attraction, which yeah. is a great. It's an ebook and it's a set of audios. And a lot of people tell us that between the four pillars and which is the ebook and Clayton's program, Actions of Attraction, that when people are paying five hundred dollars, that's worth the investment alone. So yeah, it's yeah. a lot. So we're basically inviting you to try out the membership area of the site. We're going to over the course of six months, we're going to we're going to drip out all of the modules. Uh, which have, including the pre-recorded Q&As that we do, I think it's up to 35 hours worth of video content. Mm -hmm. And we've broken it into a six-month program because it, the, the material is dense, it's insightful, we want you to have time to integrate it. And the beauty of this first module, the vision of creating a conscious relationship uh, that we are uh, allowing access to for just $1, is that this is where your entire life starts. This is where the, the new pattern gets created. So if you feel like you've been in a pattern up until now that has been creating frustration, or you have been feeling that you've been clueless or lost or trying to change things that you can't change or getting fed up with a relationship, diving into this module one, which is the setting the vision of a conscious relationship, we give you, we give you all the tools and we pop different distinctions for you to begin to pay attention to almost as ingredients like uh, paint on a paint palette. Yes. where you get to craft a vision and we really coach you in exactly how to do this craft a vision of the new version of you in the new version of a potential relationship whether you're single or not yes. uh, that you will want to live into and come from as a goal and we yes. really make this distinction very clear so this is not just about uh saying hey i want this kind of relationship this is about creating a three-dimensional model that serves as a lighthouse through the course of this entire program. And even if you ended up stopping there for whatever reason, you would get such tremendous value from this. And one of the other pieces that we do in uh, the module one, setting a vision of a conscious relationship is we actually begin to dethrone mm -hmm. something that uh, can wreak havoc on people's lives. And that is the inner critic. Mm -hmm. So, you may have noticed that maybe when you've gone through a breakup or perhaps uh, you're waiting for someone to text you back or you're in an uncertain situation, oftentimes a large majority of us have an inner critic, an inner voice that comes up that begins to speak to us in a way that's less helpful. Almost like a roommate that is residing inside of our mind that tells us things that we would never let a friend or anybody <laughs> living with us say to us, right? And that voice alone right there, sitting with that in isolation, that can have you do things out of reactivity. It can have you say things. It can have you end relationships prematurely. And so not only are we helping you create a vision in, in module one, but we're giving you some tools to distinguish this voice and actually build a healthy relationship with it so that you can start to stand more in being your own, have an inner coach inside of you to guide you along the way rather yeah. than letting this kind of younger, fearful, reactive yeah. voice drive you. Totally. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. One of the things that I so appreciate about the visions that people, you know, email 
me and us, you know, pretty much every day of the week, right, is the it, rather than the old thing, which is the shopping list, right? Mm -hmm. He'll be this, he'll be playful, he'll be able to make money, he'll be fun, he'll be adventurous, he'll be conscious, right? So, which is all over there with him, right? The shopping list of qualities that you want in a guy. This vision of a conscious relationship is so much more real, grounded, and sober, mm -hmm. and therefore so much more likely to happen. And what it starts with is how am I going to show up? How mm -hmm. am I going to be when my inner critic comes online? How am I going to be? when I'm getting triggered, right? Because you can have a guy over there, Mr. Prince Charming, with all the best qualities in the world, but you're still gonna get triggered because that's called being in a relationship if you're doing your work, yeah. right? So all of us carry wounds, frailties, vulnerabilities. And then the question is, what are you actually gonna do about them? So rather than being surprised by those things, like, oh, you have a great first month dating and then suddenly you guys have the first argument and the relationship ruptures, it's like, no, I've actually planned for this. I've thought it through how I wanna show up in this. And I'm conscious of the structures in me that are limiting my ability to connect with another person. Mm -hmm. And I'm being fully present and aware. It's like I'm aware on the light side and I'm aware on the dark side. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it's all these unconsciousness that keeps ripping the possibility of having the relationship that you want. Yeah. Right? It's not so much that he doesn't meet your shopping list. It's that there's stuff that comes up in you, inner critic, super ego, wounds, attachment insecurities. You know, and that list goes on. And we really dimensionalize that in this program. That's all the stuff that creates the stickiness that has you overcompensating, being a doormat, acting discarded, limiting your power, not speaking your truth, letting people walk on you, feeling disrespected. All those things start at home. So mm -hmm. that's where this vision starts at home with the real mm -hmm. stuff. And when yeah. people send that, I'm like, wow, cool, you get it? This is such a more real place to ground a real relationship with a real dude. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yep, yep. I'm curious if there's any questions uh, about any of the topics that we've covered so far. If there's anything well, I'll else. put this one up here. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Lou Regina says, what if I don't have anything from my childhood to heal from? Mm. I would be really curious if that's actually true, just based on my experience of, you know, obviously having worked with hundreds and thousands of people. It seems uncommon to me that there isn't some unfinished business in childhood, whether we're fully aware of it or not. Right? And so one of the defenses that can come online in childhood is I always see things positively. I look at the glass half full. Right, I might rationalize certain things. Um, maybe I have a very revered view of my parents. And sometimes once you really get in there, you notice, oh, actually, I don't like to depend on other people. You know, Or it's hard for me to be with my own sadness and my own longing. Hmm. Right, Or when I was upset, no one comforted me, so I've learned to be very self-reliant, but I don't actually know how to let a partner come in and comfort me. Um, so I, I would just really, really invite your curiosity. I don't know if you've ever worked with, you know, a therapist or a coach or are interested in joining us in the program. Um, there might be some stuff to flush up, not because we're narcissistic and we need to flush it up, but just because most of us develop some kind of compromises in childhood to fit in, to belong and to, you know, please mom and dad and to kind of keep the peace or survive. You know, even if we survive by becoming a rebellious person that rejects everyone, that's a compensatory strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I'd also be curious just as to uh, what do you find as a common occurrence or challenge uh, currently in your dating life um, that or your relationship life that has you watching this video right now? Right. What is the curiosity around? What are you trying to work on? What do you feel like there's uh, you're wanting to overcome? Uh, that could be revealing as well, because sometimes, look, if these part of the work in this is actually to distinguish the places where we're blocking ourselves. Yeah. And we don't expect you to have an awareness, a, just a dialed in awareness of exactly what might have happened in the past that caused this in the present. That's our job in the program to help you begin to distinguish. Uh, not so that you can feel sorry for yourself or feel like, oh, wow, I've got a problem. No, it's so that we can create a more coherent, aligned and integrated version of you mm -hmm. so that when you stand in the world of dating, you can create the kind of intimacy with a guy that you want to so that you can have a voice the way that you want to so that you can actually fall in love and have the courage to be in that place of risk and actually create something rather than be protecting yourself. Amen to that. Yep. Um, Lou Regina is actually in the program with us and she's just saying that she needs to dive in more deeply. So yeah, yeah thank great. You for being in the cool. program. So here's a question from Anna. Jack, I love your work. Still, isn't it dangerous to claim to help with deep seated childhood issues to people who might need long term one to one therapy? You know, so you know, I just want to say not, nothing that we're saying here uh, minimizes the potential positive impact of one to one therapy. 
right? And sometimes that's exactly what you need. Both Clayton and I have been in one-to-one -one therapy. So mm -hmm. we, get, we get the value of that. I will say this, we've had a lot of people who've been in long-term therapy and who found that we've been able to land distinctions for them that the therapist hasn't. Yeah. So I think these things can be incredibly complementary. And if you've had the experience that, yeah, I've done a bunch of therapy, maybe I've made some gains, maybe, maybe I haven't, I would say for a dollar, just give us a try. You know, you, let you be the arbiter of whether this is, is helping you or not. One of the things that may differentiate us from some of the therapeutic community is our ability to make distinctions, right? In sort of archetypical speak, both Clayton and I have quite strong scholar, which means we're able to say, this is this, that is that, and this, this thing over here is different than that thing over there. And, and sometimes when you make powerful distinctions for people, it's sort of like the light bulb goes on and you can't quite unsee what you've been invited to see. Mm -hmm. So th that I think is the, the, the power of uh, this kind of work is that you know, we're both transformational coaches. So a lot of our experience is in helping people become more of their true essence, as we call it. So we say, yeah, your personality is it's great. It might be charismatic and all these things, but it's normally a set of strategies to keep you safe or to keep you, you know, pleasing to other people or to get the attention you need. And there's something deeper and truer that we're calling essence. Most therapy isn't starting with that as the premise that we want to help you uncover your essence. And from there, let's see what relationship is possible. So I think it's also a slightly different um, departure point than a lot of classic therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not actually fixing anything that's broken. I just want to really land out. We're not, there's, we're not holding any type of, um, frame that there's something that's wrong or broken within you. Well, the, what we're doing is we're helping you distinguish a vision of the most authentic, uh, essence that can be, uh, brought forth into a dating dynamic or relationship dynamic, and then helping you begin to see the obstacles to that so that you can move through it. So I think another big difference between us and therapists is that we are really holding a vision and helping you live into that and create that on an ongoing basis throughout the course of six months. Yep, totally. The other powerful thing about this is that you're actually joining a, a learning community. Yes. Right? So this, if you join us, you'll get access to our Facebook community. Um, this is a several hundred person strong community, some of them incredibly active. Um, we are doing live streams in that Facebook community at least twice a month. Um, where we take your questions and there's something powerful about being in a community of people that when you say, oh, I'm trying to recognize an unconscious persona that I might have, other people know what you're talking about and they can help support you and reflect things back. You know, there's no substitute, I don't think, for having a community of learning where you share similar understanding concepts and can kind of support one another. So I, I've been really pleased about that aspect uh, of the program. Yeah. Uh, what do we got here? Thank you so much for all these questions and comments. Um, Candy says, I signed, I, I signed up, want to check out the material. Thank you for this trial offer, guys. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for jumping in. Cool. By the way, if there's any of you that are thinking, you know, maybe I should do this, maybe I shouldn't. I mean, we tried to make this super easy. It's just, it's literally just a dollar. You can, you can cancel any time. Um, we're giving you a lot for that dollar. Most of the time people would be spending $500 even just to get a sneak peek at this. Um, yep. But if any of you have a question you're kind of like sitting on, just let us know. We'll, we'll try and get it answered. Um, Anna says, thanks. Appreciate your in-depth answers. Sylvia says, I'm looking to be authentic. Um, and Joe says, I think what you guys do is link past behaviors with current day-to-day -day beliefs and relationships. It's great. Awesome. Yeah, nice. thanks. Yeah. And thanks. Thanks for being part of it with us. Yeah. Um, you, do you want to take a little question here, Clayton? Sure. So Rika says, thank you for the wonderful, insightful content. How can I call out flaky bad behavior for men? Is it okay to just be blunt to drive a point? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not exactly sure what your definition of blunt means. I, I'd like to pick that apart a little bit because uh, I would say, yes, you can be blunt. Um, and depending on how you're holding the flaky behavior, if there's a real judgmental energy around it, if there is uh, a, if you're holding it in a place of anger when you're communicating with them, uh, they might shut down and not actually listen and the, the conversation might not be constructive. Yes. Yes. So I would say number one, what are you wanting to create with this person who may be showing up flaky? If your intention 
is to call the flaky behavior out because you are done with the relationship and the practice of calling it out in a very blunt way would be would serve your growth and development and that's more important than maybe creating someone something with the person then yeah maybe being blunt is like an edge for you and calling it out will feel good and allow you to have a voice in that situation if what you're wanting is to create something with this person then i would be really curious and i would hold the flaky behavior as that they might not actually their behavior might not occur to them as flaky they might have other priorities or just a pattern of communicating with you and with everybody else in their life that does occur to some people as flaky. So there could be just a different value system around communication there. I often have this with text. There's different texting styles. Sometimes I'm not fast to respond to people via text. That can piss some people off and they might say, oh my God, he's stonewalling me or, or he's mm. being flaky with his text. For me, the way that texting occurs to me is it's asynchronous and because it's not on the phone, I don't have to get back to people immediately. Mm -hmm. But that's a different value system. If no one brings that up when they're communicating with me that that's a problem uh, for them or that there's an impact, I have less, I don't have the insight to actually shift my behavior. So if you're wanting to create something with this guy and you want to call it out, I would one, reveal the impact that it is having on you and be curious about what the solution might be. And be open to the fact that maybe he's got a different perspective and the, the two of you could meet in the middle somewhere. Mm. Yep. I like all that. Yeah, what I hear you saying is you're actually making minimum assumptions about his world and you're taking the time to communicate what's true for you and the impact on you. You know, one of the yeah. things that we teach in Becoming the One is availability for impact which is where you stop taking responsibility for other people's feelings and experience and you get much more curious and available for what, what's the impact. You know, if, if, if a friend of Clayton is not getting the text back and that's having the impact that they feel, I don't know, frustrated or they feel like they don't matter, Clayton could be available for that impact. That doesn't mean that he does or doesn't have to change any of his behaviors. That's kind of, you know, up for negotiation. Um, but. But then it's not like, oh, I'm wrong, I'm guilty, oh, I should have texted back sooner. We just kind of nix all that and we get a little bit more real and clear with, uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you don't want to step unconsciously into trying to be a guy's coach or accountability partner, right? I think it's much easier to try and, and uh, let a guy kind of figure out his own edges of his masculine development and his ability to kind of keep, keep agreements and commitments. If that doesn't work for you, I'd maybe find another guy to partner. Anytime that you're trying to sort of hold him accountable, you said you're going to do this, you didn't do that. Yeah, bring things to him, but also don't step into an unconscious role there that isn't actually going to um, further the relationship, right? Lead with the reveal of the impact on you rather than here's my advice about your, what I perceive as flaky behavior. So again, that, start at home. Love it. Love it. And to that point too, I mean, there's a difference between saying, hey, look, your behavior is flaky versus actually saying what you want. Hey, I think I'm needing a little bit more consistent communication with you to feel comfortable. Yeah. Just, just say that last bit again, Clayton. I think you were just a little bit in and out there. The part about, uh, yeah, there was a call coming in. Excuse me. Uh. So, uh, just that you were saying this rather than labeling flaky that you actually name what you want, which was something like more consistent communication. Yeah. Name what you want rather than your judgment of their behavior, right? Yeah. Give the man some direction of what you want. So he has a chance to win rather than he gets defensive in your communication. Interesting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So look, welcome. Any of you that have joined us more recently, I'm Jack Butler. I'm live here with Clayton Olson. We are teaching partners in a program called Becoming the One. We are inviting you to join us. It's literally just a dollar. If you click this link, becomingtheone.us forward slash dollar, you can get into the program today, immediately get access to module one of the program, uh, building the vision of a conscious relationship. Thank you so much for all your questions and comments here. Um, feel free to say hi if you haven't yet. Uh, we will get to a few more questions. Um, but look, by the way, if you want us to be answering your questions regularly, that's a great reason to come and join us in the trial because we have an mm -hmm. active Facebook community where both Clayton and I answer questions. Sometimes we both answer the same question if we have different perspectives on it. And we go live at least twice a month, either together or individually. 
uh, where we do a lot of Q&A and we do some additional teaching. So if you kind of want us in your corner, this is the best way to have us in your corner. And, and so also, honestly, they join the program just for that alone. They love the content, but they mm -hmm. like having us in their corner. They like having us there for that date when something went a bit weird and they don't know, or it's been going well and suddenly the guy pulls away and they want to get input from coaches who have a male perspective that they trust and we can be those people for you. Yeah, and I think also I want to say that we have some very smart, intelligent, conscious women for in the sure. community. For sure. who have done the work, who've been through the course uh, over the course of the last year, who have been doing the work and they're there to support you as well. So we're really creating a community of just curated women that are on this path uh, yeah. that you get to get their opinions and their support and their perspective on things. And then you also get to hear what we have to say about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the modules is called... Um, the uh, the manual to the the male mind, ah. um, understanding men. Yeah. And uh, here's a question that kind of is in that territory. I'll push this mm -hmm. to you. And I'm dating sure. a great guy. Says Sonia. He's 50, and his wife of 25 years died five months ago. He mm -hmm. had a good marriage. How long should I give him to make me a priority? Mm. So this will be relevant to any of you that are in the situation where you, you know, you're dating or relating with a guy who has been in a significant relationship and maybe you're wondering, is he, is he over it? Is he grieved? Is there a rebound? Where do I stand? How long do I give him? Yeah, yeah. Well, five months ago, out of a 25-year relationship. Yeah, it's um, not long. That's not long. Yeah, that's not long. And so there's a couple different ways to answer this question, okay? Uh, one of them, Sonia, is uh, we could talk about like, you know, just like statistically speaking, how long does it take for someone to get over their last relationship? And from our, from what we've seen in terms of all the, the thousands of people we work with in the patterns, uh, you know, what does that look like in terms of a number? Now, I would say that five months, this, this man may need more time. And I'm also curious if this guy is getting support around that. Like, is, yeah. is he actively seeking therapy or is he does he have a channel or a place where he can process uh, the, the, uh, the marriage and also the death of his wife? Because if that's something he's holding in and he's just trying to execute over and be a man over it, which a lot of guys do, um, those create landmines in the relationship. And you might find as you get deeper and deeper with him uh, or that you're ending up just having to wait longer and longer because he's not really doing the work necessary to close this chapter and create a new one. Just because his wife passed away does not mean that he's over it or that chapter is done. So I'd be really listening to where he's at from a compassionate friend point of view and really trusting if he's saying anything explicitly to you that he's not ready for a relationship, he doesn't know when he's going to be ready for a relationship, I would trust him. I would really yes. trust that this man, when a guy says that, he means it. He really means it when he says that. Uh, guys that are interested in women and they're ready for a relationship, don't say that. It's, it's not something that comes out of their mouth. So that's one way of looking at this. It's just kind of what's happening over there. What's his process for closing this chapter? But then there's another component, Sonia, about where you're at. So I would be curious, who are you being in the waiting? Okay. So how long should I give him to, for him to make me a priority? Um, are you turning against yourself in this space? Okay, are you finding yourself turning against yourself being like, God, if I was just worth more, if our relationship or connection was worth more, then he would move, move on more quickly? Uh, kind of almost okay. personalizing it. Yeah, are you personalizing it? Because if you are, if you start to personalize it, you start to find yourself creating accusations against you or against him that are negative, it's probably a sign to move on because that is actually a breeding ground for toxicity. Now, yeah. if rather than waiting, what if we switch it to, can you be with where he's at, right? Maybe there's actually some work for you in being in a kind of light connection with this, with this guy and for you to be single and to be able to connect from your own sovereignty and allow this guy to connect from his own timeline and sovereignty. And maybe that's a real growth edge for you. And if you can be in that and be in your loving, then, and maybe it's an opportunity to give him as long as you feel comfortable giving him. There's no real like hard and fast rule here. So I would just be really curious as to if you start to have negative thoughts about him, negative thoughts about yourself, 
that's toxic, that's detrimental. And it's just, it's, it's, um, the, it's the, it's contrary to building something with somebody. It shakes the foundation. Mm, totally. Yeah. Just one, I love all that Clay. And one, one super quick thing to add, uh, a distinction that we really dimensionalize in the Becoming the One program. We talk about three different qualities of relationship. We talk about companionship, mm. we talk about lovership, and we talk about partnership. And in, in gross generalization, in my experience, when men are stepping out of a significant long-term partnership, oftentimes initially, what they're really available for is, is companionship, which is really, I want connection, I want friendship, but I don't really want to have any serious obligations to you. Um, or maybe lovership, right? That it has this kind of romantic sexual flavor. And what we don't want to do is be in companionship and waiting for the upgrade to partnership. Mm. Oftentimes it never comes. So that's why we talk about dating the present. You know, when Clayton's saying, you know, what's going on for you right now? Can you be with what's here? If you can only be with what's here on the future promise of something a bit better, I would, I would just emphasize a little note of caution that statistically yep. I, I don't see that happen that often. It can be a privilege to be the woman in this instance that a guy who is healing a long-term marriage or grieving turns to. That can be a really neat thing. It's just different than we necessarily have a, a mutually growing and obligated relationship kind of going forward. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Clayton, what's, um, what's your favorite module? in the mm. program philosophy like what 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 floats your boat what's what <laughs> turns your cogs what say module six spirit? module six yeah module six. Is, mm -hmm. the last one the last one is my favorite uh which is becoming the one and what i love so much about it is in some ways what we're doing for the program is we're giving you these distinctions and we're helping you craft the vision we're helping you uh, come from a place of wholeness and completeness, see yourself differently. We're helping you see men differently. We're helping you understand communication, the dynamic between you differently. And when we get into module six, what we're doing is we're bringing it all together, but we're bringing it all together in a way where we're giving you access to the distinction of surrender, of actually being able to bring it all together. And then what is the way of being where you're not just running around with just all of this knowledge in your head, mm -hmm. um, but how do you actually show up now in the world of dating and relationship and have fun at every step of the way? Even if you're single and you're in a, the paradigm that there's no good men out to date, there's no good men out there to date, how do you find yourself being able to love being right there as well? Right? What's the stance that you need to take? What's the perspective? What is the uh, what are the internal questions and the beliefs that you can begin to adopt to finally feel completely okay with exactly where you're at and trusting that life is going to support you and give you what you need as you take steps forward from a place of curiosity and openness. Absolutely. That's why it's my favorite because I feel like it just it's, it starts to get into the deeper spiritual, deeper psych psychological aspects yeah. of just life in general and your, your orientation towards that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that is quite consonant with what well, you were talking about, secure attachment with life, mm -hmm. right? The sense that life is for you, not against you. Life might yes. bring lots of trials and tribulations and challenges. Obviously, it will. Obviously, it already has. But a sense that I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of on the river and I'm going with the current, even if I'm, even if I'm you know, steering mm -hmm. um, or ruddering, rather than I'm trying to, uh, you know, row the boat upstream. If you have the experience that parts of your life feel like you're trying to push something up the hill or row upstream, mm. what Clayton is pointing to here is a, is a different way of being in the world, where you're actually in a deeper rapport with yourself and a deeper alignment with life. And from that place, a lot of things that may have seemed impossible may actually be a lot more possible. And um, so this, this kind of goes beyond just relationship. This is really kind of like a, a philosophy and approach for life. Um, Sylvia says, I'm in. Well, great. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. If you have taken us up on the free trial, feel free just to, to let us know here. Um, if any of you have any questions or things that are coming up that are stopping you from stepping into that, um, let us know here. Uh, we've got someone checking in from Oz. Thanks. There's such a broad group of people here. I super, um, appreciate it. Um, Jackie says, hi guys, I'll catch up later. Um, can you see Amanda's question? This one? Yeah. How does one find a balance between being a high value woman 
or as society often labels pushes queen the prize etc versus being giving true authentic showing true essence and vulnerability i like that yeah you want to take a crack at it and then i can kind of pepper in some of my thoughts yeah i guess i see these as just different aspects of being real right that i don't necessarily see a uh, contradiction between being in your kind of queenly power right that you know what does it really mean to be a queen of the queendom right it means yeah. that you're going to take care of a bunch of people in in your realm right so the ultimate sovereigns give a lot and care a lot and actually take responsibility for a lot so i don't necessarily see the distinction there i do have a, a view on being a high value woman i think of being a high value woman is the solution to being a low value woman in the sense that if you've struggled with uh, feeling secure in yourself or esteem or holding your true boundaries or naming your needs and desires, the move is towards being a high value woman. Then at a certain point, you may also want to relax that a little bit because sometimes, uh, you know, being high value can become its own form of distortion, right? There's sort of pressure on myself that I have to show up in a certain way, or I sort of walk around and I name these really strong boundaries to people, but actually true boundaries are about selective permeability, letting the right things in, keeping the wrong things out. True boundaries aren't just about necessarily being strong. And that basically your sense of ego may get tied up with being high value. That's what I'm pointing to, that there's, there's going to be a point that your essence actually doesn't want to have the label high or low value. It might actually just want to be free of that um, so that you can do what's true and real and authentic. Right, that that might become more important. Like you, the authenticity of your heart may become more important than the sort of the the label um, of being high value. But I think practicing being high value at a certain point in time is is a really good solution to not being that. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Clay? Yeah, I like where you're going with that, and Ooh. and I think it's a really great question, Amanda. I think yeah. it's um, uh, what I love about the question is that uh, I think it it points to how uh, oftentimes we will see uh, giving and vulnerability uh, as sometimes being uh, a doormat, right? That that is equated with weakness rather than strength. Mm. And I would say that it depends on where that giving in that vulnerability comes from. If if the giving and the vulnerability... Her own continuation of that question, in, ca in case that gives you a little bit of a flavor of it. She, you know, she says, yeah. I always feel like I have to bring my A game in order to be high value and not replaceable quote or a yeah. quote. I'm exhausted. Right, right, right. So I get it. So the the exhaustion, I imagine, and it, it, I'm uh, making an assumption here, but I'm imagining that the exhaustion is coming from feeling like you're having to put up an act rather than actually being yourself in the connection fully. Right. And and I would say that um, in in my definition of like the queen energy or the prize, uh, let's call that the integrated woman. Right. It's it's the woman that. Uh, actually has flexibility and strength and courage to go in and reveal her own vulnerability, to give from a place of true generosity, which means that she's, she's giving because the act of giving is an expression of who she is. She's not giving to get. She's not giving because she fears that if she doesn't give, that she's going to lose approval or lose validation from the person that she's with. The giving is giving without any strings attached. It really isn't. And Real now, gift, basically. Yeah. And you might think, well, God, I don't want to be taken advantage of because if I'm doing that and the person's taking advantage of me, then uh, my, my response to that is, look, if you're being generous and you're giving and you're feeling taken advantage of, you may be with, with the wrong person. Right. Right. Your generosity and your giving coming from that place, this is how you actually qualify who you want to be in a relationship with because a relationship you know, one of the premises that I operate from and Jack does as well is that relationship is a mirror and relationship is a platform. It's a place where we get to play and access certain states of being and uh, virtues that we otherwise don't really get to do when we're single. So if we're holding back in relationship because of being feared of taking advantage of, uh, I get really curious around who we're actually with, right? That we have to have that fear. Um, yep. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Nicole says, hi, guys. How is this different from your other program, Three Keys? Um, so th the Three Keys is actually a, uh, a webinar that Clayton and I have been running for over a couple of years now, mm -hmm. um, which if you haven't done it, it's great. I, I recommend you do it. But 
if you go into that webinar, the invitation that we make is actually for you to come and join this program. So there's not there's not yeah. a different program. It's just a different on ramp. Um, but this is the you know that <laughs> this offer versus what we've ever done historically. This is sort of like a ridiculous offer in a sense. So if you want to get into the program and you haven't, I would click that link and do yeah. it while this offer is still available because we're not committing to giving this as an ongoing offer. This is a no best offer for us. And uh, if you want to avail of it, you know, when would now be a good time? When would now, right? Yeah. Uh, there's there's two things I just want want to point out about the dollar offer here too, and you know I think this is brought on because one of the reasons is we understand that there's a certain uh, demographic of folk who uh, are wanting to spend 497 right up front and, and dive into the modules immediately, uh, and we were Jack and I were in conversation about this and we were thinking well how can we expand our reach how can we get this into more people's hands uh, and uh, allow maybe the to, to stretch out the program to a place where it can be maybe even more digestible. Uh, and yeah, we, we see how much difference this is making in women's lives. We've had about 700 people through the program right now. Uh, out of all of the graduates that we've surveyed, 100% recommend the program. And so we know this is a life-changing program. It's a way for you guys to get kind of behind the closed doors of what it's like to work with Jack and I. Um, community and building a community and continuing to have the inspiration to create content for you all. Uh, it, this is also a motivating factor there. And then simultaneously with just the world the way that it is and the economy and all of the uncertainty that totally. is, is present, uh, what a perfect time to be able to get in for a low risk and to start doing some of this deeper, permanent, long-lasting work on yourself. Absolutely. Yep. Well said. Uh, let me see if we have something else here. We're also going to be coming to our wrap up. We're going to be wrapping yeah. up here on the hour. Um, we don't get to your question. You know, thank you for it. And uh, come and ask it. You know, if there's something we didn't get to, come and for a dollar, come and join the community. And then you'll actually be on a Facebook live stream with us. And it will be a much smaller group than typically we have when we go live here. Uh, yeah. On, on YouTube. Um, Nancy says, I want in. Awesome. We'll look forward to uh, having you in. Muppet Puppet says, what's the best way to stay present and sober so I don't start projecting my story to a new guy who I don't even know? Journaling meditation, question mark. I have insight to my silly thoughts, but need practical advice or need practice. Um, yeah, I mean, my sense is you're pointing to a whole stream of development, which is called dropping the story. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is something that is part of the becoming the one cur curriculum. Yes. Right? How to create more empowering narratives and also to know when to actually drop the narrative and just be with what's in front of you. Right? If you're going to date the present or the past or the future, part of that is this sort of quality of abiding. It's this quality of being with what's actually in front of you. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the best ways to get sober is to actually just drop your expectations in dating. Like what's it like to approach dating without having expectations and just really paying attention to what is happening, not what you wished would happen, not what you'd hoped would happen, just to actually use dating as a way of waking up, right? Because the, the classic way, one of them at least, that people lose sobriety is that they create this whole narrative about what, where the connection's going, who the guy is, what he's thinking, what he's feeling, and then at some point, he maybe becomes drop-off guy, and then you're left kind of floundered and confused, and you feel like the rug got pulled. Mm. When you're really present and grounded in yourself, it's very hard to pull the rug because your rug is firmly under you. What someone else is doing is what they're doing, right? So you kind of drop the fantasy and the expectations on the connection, and you just track it much more accurately in a more day-to-day, -day, slow, sober, eat-your-vegetables kind of way. Thank you for that question. Uh, Clayton, are you still there? We seem to have... Uh, I am, can you hear me? I can hear you. you, just to me, you're currently showing no uh, no video, and that's fine, you know, if you need to take a moment, you need to just compose yourself, uh, that's okay, you know, we all, we all have a value and right to privacy. 
I'm just you know, I can't, I can't turn on my video, Jack. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you don't get to see me anymore. I'm gonna. It's gonna be black eye for the rest the of the impact of that. I notice I feel a little, a little low. And I, there's a little bit of fear rising. Not quite sure where this is going. <laughs> not quite sure why you're doing this, but I'm not gonna take it personally. Um, it's my avoidant attachment side, Jack. <laughs> <showing up. laughs> um, okay. Let me know if there's anything that I can do to bring you back on screen. Because I don't, I don't think you can. I've been trying to do something here. It's just, ah, okay. yeah, it's not bringing it up. So Joe says, "Is that a pound?" Um, so it's less than a pound. I'm not sure what the current exchange rate is, but I would have said it's something like uh, 70 pence, maybe 75. Not sure quite what uh, Boris has been doing over the weekend um, to affect pound sterling, but yeah, it's, it's less than a pound. Thanks for asking. Um, uh, all right. Eukalena says, what is the thing with my guy? Apparently when he's having a busy week, he checked my message. I miss you, but not say anything. WTH. Uh, yeah. Clayton, you there? Yep, I'm here. I'm okay. here. I'm reading it. Yeah. Uh, so this is so I, when you say what's the thing with my guy, I'm curious as to what your status with this guy is. Because I depending on do you guys have agreements in place? Is there uh, some type of shared reality around what communication uh, is expected between the two of you? Um, is this your, are you saying that this is your guy, meaning that like he's the one that you're focused on? Does he know that? Mm. Um, right? Or is he maybe in more of the reality of uh, a more casual connection? Um, right. Totally. Yeah. And then also, too, like it could just be that he's got a different texting style as well. Totally. Yeah. And that you say you miss you, you say I miss you. And, uh, I'm noticing though that if you if you have a problem with saying that and then him not responding, it sounds like you're saying I miss you, which is actually a question of like, hey, do you miss me too? Or what do you think about that? Yeah. Rather than just making a statement. So, you know, guys operate very literally sometimes too. So he might get it and just be like, oh, okay, yeah, she misses me. That's sweet. And I'm yeah. here. I'll see her when I see her. It's no yeah. big deal. Right. right. So, but for you, I would say, is there a place where you can lean in and maybe even reveal a little bit more about what you're really wanting from him? Are you wanting some more connection? And you're kind of subtly saying that uh, through I miss you. Yes. Yeah. So I, it, in another language, and again, this is something that we talk about, we talk about levels of revealing. Clayton's kind of inviting you to notice what would your authentic reveal be? Right. Is, is it I miss you? And actually what I'm experiencing is loneliness or a lack of connection, or I need reassurance, because these might all be kind of truer ways rather than a, a perhaps a covert strategy of expecting reciprocation. Um, it might be that your communication styles are a little incompatible. That's possible. I would just say, you know, I don't know, Clayton, what your view of this. I would have thought I'm probably on the more relational end of guys. And if I'm busy in the middle of my day, you probably are, are not going to get a quick reply to a text like that, unless in that moment I'm like, oh, wow, I'm having that exact same experience. But if I'm trying to crunch something in my work or business, I'm probably not having the experience that I miss you. Yeah. Because most guys tend to be a bit compartmentalized, like I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, what we call the, you know, the masculine soul focus. It's not obviously just just the masculine that can do that, but it is one expression of the masculine. So it's like I kind of look at that. Is basically I'm looking at that. Is anything on fire? Is there any immediate problem to solve here? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I might not text you back because I'm kind of in busy mode, do mode, solutions mode. And that part of kind of accessing my deeper heartfelt connection, it may not just be front and center. It certainly isn't for me most of the time that I'm kind of in work, particularly if it's kind of computer-based work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it might be if you need to hear something more meaningful back that maybe you just hold it until you guys are in person and you are actually connected. And then you see what happens um, in that kind of space, you know? And the other thing you, you, that this might help you wake up is, is there any possibility that you might be over-responsive in your text to other people, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. you get into it, people actually feel this kind of obligation. They have to get back to everyone super quick and it's not actually authentic. It means yeah. that you have other people's needs ahead of your own. Sometimes you're writing people back saying, hey, I hope you're having a great day inside. You're feeling resentful, right? So it's, it, it's actually good to, to kind of just slow into yourself and notice, is there anything in here for you? And there may yeah. not be, but there may well be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, Jack, I mean, one of the benefits of this course that I'm just realizing too, as we, as we pull some of this apart, you know, something is like, as simple as a question, uh, like, like the question was, that was just asked, like I texted him, I missed him. 
He doesn't get back to me. What the hell's going on? Like when we start to unpack this, we, we can start to see that how we do anything is how we do everything. And as we start to put mm. some of this in slow motion and really begin to examine the unspoken expectations and the beliefs that we're operating under and the ways to create secure attachment within ourselves, like it changes the entire geometry of our life, right? It can change the geometry of your friendships. You might end up being more empowered with your friendships. You might actually end up having more boundaries with your family if there's any toxicity there. You might end up actually leading more in your work. And so intimate relationship and becoming the one in this is really just a, a, it's a practice ground for finding full expression in other areas of your life as well. So I really want to just emphasize that, that this is not just about like how to get a guy to text you back or um, how to be more empowered just in dating. This is like, how do you actually show up and be a conscious leader in your life mm -hmm. and begin to come from vulnerability and heart centered and be empowered to be able to draw the boundaries when you need to need to walk away from situations that aren't serving you and also call forth the best in the people that you are interacting in. Absolutely. So look, if any or all of that sounds interesting, it's obviously important to do, just come and join us in the $1 trial, test drive, see if this style of work is one that works for you. If it doesn't, yeah. worries. if it does, you've got a lot to gain and we'd love to have you as part of the community with us ongoing. So becoming the one dot, us forward slash dollar that gets you in it just brings you through to a page it's a short form page you can just put your details in at the bottom and the moment you do that you'll get access to module one and the four pillars of conscious relationship ebook which we by the way have been told was worth the 497 investment on its own so it's actually a really cool ebook that clayton and i co-wrote uh, practices of a conscious relationship how to use relationship to wake you up um, Clayton, we are on the top of the hour here. Is there anything that you haven't had a chance to say or anything that you want to encourage people as we close out here? Yeah, I just want to say it's a dollar. It's a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't jump in. I, I, I thought you were a smart guy. I wanted something with a little bit more. <laughs> um, but I, I'm happy. No, I, I've now, already said all my smart things. Now, now I'm just going to say simple things at this point. Yeah, no, it's 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 a dollar. So, you know, we're, we're keeping the... Uh, we want to keep the bar low so that yeah. you don't even have to make the decision about whether uh, you like the course uh, until afterwards. Like, like jump in, explore it. It's some of the best content that we've created. The stuff that we create on YouTube is great. It's small little bite-sized appetizers. This is the main course, right? Yeah. This is this is the the Real meat pasta. and potatoes. And if you're uh, a vegan, this is the tofu and and the salad. This this is it. And uh, if you've been following us and you have not checked out this program, this is your chance. Get in there. Um, and it, if, you, if you don't, I get it. It's, uh, it. This might not be an area where you're wanting to commit to yet and actually grow. But when you are ready and you're wanting to take this part of your life to the next level, this program is the vehicle to do that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation here. Thank you for saying hello. I realize we didn't get the chance to say hello back to all, all of you but we appreciate it. Uh, if you want us in your corner regularly, this is the best way of doing it. Come and join us while we still have this limited offer open. Um, Clayton, thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks for being my teaching partner in this program. I've really enjoyed creating it with you. And yeah, thank you, brother. And I'm excited about the energy that we're bringing to this community this year with our, our live streams and the new content that we're going to be creating. If you come into the program now, you'll get grandfathered for new content that we create going forward. So it's a good time to get in. We want you to come in, check it out, becomingtheone.us forward slash dollar. And as always, everyone, thanks for being here with us. We super appreciate the way that you support our channels and, and that we get to do this work. And we hope to be working with you more deeply sometime soon. Yep. All right. So goodbye from me. Yep. Thanks for showing up, guys. Yep. Goodbye from Clayton. And uh, we'll talk with you soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.